we're live. All right. Welcome back to World Strong's Opinions, episode 38, with none other than the Texas Stone man himself, Travis Ortmeyer. Welcome to the show, man. It is awesome to have uh, such a great legend as yourself joining us. <laughs> People throw that word around, man. I'm just a dude who lifts weights. That's that's right. That's because you're modest. <laughs> but, but I mean, the truth is, if, I mean, you look... When did you start strongman? Like 2001? 22 or, years ago two, next week. 22 years ago. Not very many people can say that. There's a, That is a very, very select elite crew that can yeah. say you've been uh, competing as long as you have. Too stupid to quit, man. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you're starting to sound like me too now. That's what I, I mean, I'm a little, what are you, 41, 42? Yeah, I'll be 42. Uh, I, I, I started strongman the week before my birthday my 21st birthday so i'll be 42 been it for you know 21 22 years so yeah 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 it's just been my life man for most of my life that's right man i'm 44 and i always say kind of the same thing like i'm a i'm a never masters and i'm just gonna go until until the brakes fall off <laughs> that's you know that's, that's something <laughs> i've been thinking about you know, I've heard people say, I'm going to ride this till the wheels fall off. And then I see them retiring and giving up and stopping. Like That, that ain't till the wheels fall off. That's not right. even close. <laughs> it's not even close. Well, I mean, imagine there's got, there's got to be a point in age where um, something starts to break. Right. I don't know where that is, but that's kind of my that's my my <laughs> destiny. In the it's somewhere past it's, uh, Mark Felix. <laughs> you know, you, <clears throat> everything starts to break after a while. Right. It's not something that starts to break. It's literally just everything starts breaking. <clears throat> Push too hard for too long, you know, and, and especially the way that I train and compete, I'm all intensity and adrenaline. And usually guys like me don't last very long. 22 years is a long damn time. Yeah. Most of the guys who compete with, uh, kind of the fire and the rage that I compete with, they last five, maybe six years. And that's it. That's max. So, I mean, that's a, that's a testament to, uh, I mean, again, to the, to the legendary status, man, you gotta own it. <laughs> you gotta own it because I'm, there's a lot of people, um, whether you know it or not, that look up to you. I mean, I've been following you for many, many years. I mean, you know, I started starting man back in uh, 2008, and some of my first introduction to the sport was uh, was you competing in IFSA. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh five, six, and seven. Yep. That IFSA was tough, man. IFSA. A lot of people don't even know about IFSA nowadays, but they they they're missing out on a, a really significant chunk of strongman history because you know they'll say that Zidrunas has four world strongest man titles, but he has two. IFSA titles when yep. World Strongest Man was nowhere near as elite as IFSA, uh, as far as the the competitiveness of the athletes, you know. But a lot of those guys at World Strongest Man during those years went on to become really good. Terry Hollins being one of them. Yeah. Uh, but he was brand new. You know, these guys were all very very green rookies, uh, and all the top guys except for Marius went over to IFSA. So, you know, there's two of Marius's victories that should have an asterisk next next to them they weren't the real world championships <laughs> and that was 2000 what six and seven five and seven five the oh six was when phil fister that's who had phil just fister, taken right. sixth place at ifsa worlds the year before he came over and won world's strongest man beating uh marius Pujanowski. so it's just kind of a, a testament to the depth of the field the other one was uh, the Arnold 2006. They took five guys from IFSA. They took five guys from World's Strongest Man. And, uh, you know, that, that was their 10-athlete field. And first through fifth was IFSA, and sixth through tenth was World's Strongest Man. That's just – that was the placings overall. Yeah, that's amazing. So what – you're? I mean, you're obviously a bit of a historian. You've been in it for a very, very long time. Um, what happened exactly with IFSA? Oh, man, it was just a pissing match between IMG and the guys who ran the strongman side of things. 
you know, that's all it was. It's just politics, you know? Okay. So they split. If so decided to take all their athletes with them and, right. and to, to try and break world's strongest man's will, I think. Uh, and for a few years they were doing really well, but if had too many hands in the cookie jar, wow. too many guys trying to get paid, not doing enough work. And, uh, they just burned out, I think. Yeah, because then they didn't they uh, go bankrupt or something. They couldn't couldn't get their well, equipment out of out of port or something. Was that kind of the the, that the was straw the that result. broke the camp? Yeah, that was the result. What happened was 2007. We had the the world championships in Korea, South Korea, and some government official took the cash and ran. Ah. The, uh, the, all the prize money. There was no prize money given out because he just straight up stole it and took off. <laughs> Damn. Damn. So yeah, I didn't know that. Um, I mean, I kind of, I, I sort of know a little bit of the history of the the ISA and IMG split, and somewhere in there, SEL kind of split out too, right? Then they all sort yeah. of come from the the same the so, same pedigree of sorts. <laughs> Yeah, there were two guys that were with IFSA, that were involved with IFSA, that basically didn't want to have anything to do with IFSA anymore. So they split off and they created their own league, and that's Strongman Champions League. Ilka Kiernanen and yeah. Marcel Mostert. Yeah. They uh, they just wanted to make you know a simple like Super Series type thing with a championship at the end. And I think they have been very successful in that because they have between 12 and 16 competitions a year. Yep. The contests are always fun. Yeah. It's always a really good time. It's in some really cool location as well because it's always, you know, part of a, a, a tourist type thing that we're helping promote an area. And so we get right. to go see some cool stuff, have good competitions. And then there's a world championship at the end of the season. Right. Yeah, and I don't think SEL, I was talking about it on the show that SEL – in, at least in the United States, doesn't get the recognition it deserves. I mean, they pump out amazing quality shows. I mean, uh, as far as the production value goes, the equipment is next level, right? Great yeah. athletes. I and mean, they're, and they're, they're amazing competitions. Yeah, so it, it kind of depends. The equipment depends on the location. Some are better than others. <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, you know, that's, that's just part of the fun. That's, sure. You know, you get some backwoods. Uh, competition in Slovenia, this Champions League sponsored or, you know, or certified or whatever you want to call it. Uh, but then you've got some that are like the the England Champions League. Uh, incredible equipment. Really, really cool. That Viking walk with a giant log. Oh, yeah. You know, the big log farmer's walks. It was it was great equipment. Um, you know, you could tell they put a lot of time and effort and money into that show. So the promoters... So Marcel and Ilka, they work with local promoters. They are not the direct promoter of a competition. And it comes down to what that promoter does as far as the equipment, the extravagance, sure. the, you know, all the, the flair and the fun. Sure. Um, but the theme is it's always in a really cool location. And it is with equipment that is at least standard quality. You know, there's yeah, never yeah. been any janky, shitty equipment that we didn't want to use. Sure. Sure. Yeah. And I'm, uh, I guess I, I kind of knew that, that they worked with local. I mean, I think it's smart versus, you know, if they used to pay the shipping to move their, their very standardized equipment all around the world, which, which was kind of a nice thing about it. So it was uh, that standardization, I think, at least, yeah. at least I like that. Um, it's easier to understand, or it's more comprehensive as a, as a fan to know, what one log, you know, to to the next competition, the uh, the challenge actually is right. It's the same exact log, same dimensions. You know, yeah. It makes more sense that you know more weight is more weight. It's the same, or, or it's actually a harder challenge rather than, you know, sometimes you see these logs that are you know 13 inches with one yeah. weight and then 10 inches with the other. Right. It's kind of a different difficulty level. <laughs> but that's, I mean, as far as like making a standard world record, it was the way to go. Yeah. You know, on that end, I really liked their stuff. But on the other end, what I really love about Strongman is that everything is so different. Sure. You know, it comes down to who can figure out the piece of equipment the best on that day and then still be strong in the meantime. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of thinking involved. Right. 
Yeah, we talk about that a lot on here. Uh, John's actually starting a strongman standards website, I think. I, hopefully, yeah, I, hopefully I yeah. didn't say that too soon. <laughs> I, know, I know. I'm still in the middle of <laughs> kind of getting it set up. But it's funny, last year, near when we started, um, Luke Davis was on the show from the UK. And I bought strongmanstandards.com, which I was shocked that that was an available website for $12. And apparently it was coming up for renewal soon. So we're going to try to kind of crowdsource some things and just have like a rough guideline of like, what's a good lift? What's a bad lift? Because recently it feels like things have gotten kind of soft as far as lockouts go for like yeah. deadlifts, deadlifts, especially like Giants Live a few years ago when everyone broke a thousand pounds. It's a little bit rough to watch. And, and stuff, this is so. basically aimed at world records. Yeah. Yeah. World records, but then just helping people out in general with like trying to run shows as like a nice reference point and stuff. Because I, I think that would be good because there are definitely some uh, some records that may or may not should be records. You know, there's uh, <laughs> just a particular axle record where the feet were moving a lot. They did <laughs> stick for a second. Uh, but the log, the log, what you just, yeah, you know, that, that, uh, that was hard to watch. That was, yeah, you have to go on, the thing. You have to go on scroll Magnuson through. was Sorry. super strict back in IFSA. Magnus Vare was, you didn't want to have Magnus as your judge, or maybe you did because you knew that anything you did was perfect. And it's like, they've kind of, I don't know, they've told them to, to tone it down a little bit. Maybe, maybe they wanted more records. They needed more flair but yeah he's uh his judging is not quite as strict as it used to be and i i personally try to model my judging after him uh, which is actually harder than it sounds um you know i've judged many competitions and something comes up in almost every one of them where i really have to like think about how to do it correctly and, and as an example I was judging a contest. It had a vertical pull, you know, the rope yeah. where you, you pull. It didn't have a ratcheting system, so it was pull, and the weight was kind of moving up and down the whole time. Sure. Well, you had to climb this rope or pull this rope down to a piece of tape, and we made it in the rules that all you had to do was touch the piece of tape. Now, when it comes to judging that, you're standing on one side. If I got a guy that jumps and slaps that piece of tape, on the opposite side and I can't tell if he's actually over the tape or not. It, it makes it really difficult. So that's one of those nuanced things where now as a judge, I'm going to make you wrap your hand around the piece of tape. You have to actually grab it, not touch it. You have to yeah. wrap your hand around it. And then you get the down signal because there was a couple calls where I wasn't hundred percent sure if the guy had actually hit the tape or not, you know? So, and there's a lot of things like that, you know, with yeah. the, especially with rep events or medley events, like a press medley. Everybody wants to burn through it quickly. You know, you really got to match up with the judge that if there's two lanes, you've really got to sync up with the judge that's next to you. Otherwise, you know, you're the hard judge, they're the easy judge, and your whole lane is getting screwed. There yeah, shouldn't be just... a hard and easy judge. <laughs> we, we talk about that all the time that, you know, kind of getting back to the standards that it'd be really great as strongmen, especially at the highest levels, um had some standardization for judging where it was you know uh, um as consistent across the board as possible so there's nothing worse like you said when you have you know one judge being more lenient than another judge or in worst case i've seen it where one judge is judging completely differently than, than another judge right yeah <laughs> yeah you'll see that with like deadlifts when like some judges are very strict about like touch and go. And then other judges are just like, yeah, just counting the reps as they go. And I think that can be a hard thing. So a part of it, since I own the domain, I was like, I'll try to build out this site just to like show examples of like, here's a good lift. Here's a lift that was a record, but could be questionable and everything. Like maybe don't, don't get those kind of records like, out. Video examples yeah. and like, yeah, because yeah, okay. that's the main goal is just so, cause right now, it's one of those things that does get hard of like a great example recently of good judging was um, big laws was doing the 18 inch at, uh, deadlifts recently. And I think Ivor Smokstellis was doing it and had it locked out, but his knees weren't locked. And Laz was like, kept pointing and was like, 
your knees. And he finally locked his knees out. And he was like, even though you're a friend, like you have to have a good lift. Cause like, otherwise it starts to get sketchier and sketchier. Like I get the point of you want everyone to like put up and say numbers and stuff, but then it can be weird. And the nice thing is big laws has talked about like having better judging. Cause like world's strongest man, when he was like, well, at least it was consistently bad. And yeah. you're like consistently bad isn't like anything to like be <laughs> proud of. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> like at least they consistently handed out reps and everything. So it's like I think just trying to have those video things because describing it is oftentimes hard when people are just like feet, feet level, arms locked out. But in reality, like we've talked about on this show multiple times, that if you if your body is fully locked out with any kind of lift. You, it should be relatively easy to hold it for at least a few seconds. And if you literally couldn't hold it more than like that hair of a second that the judge set down, how locked out could it be? And I think like, you're right. I'm like Magnus. I mean, you look at Magnus taking away half Thor's like the double dips scandal and everything. And now it's like the, yeah. those, the circus now, that's, that's passing. You, you, you brought up, overhead press as an, an example so <clears throat> one of the things i had to figure out what i wanted to do as a judge is when is the lift good is it when the athlete is locked and holding it or is it when i actually give the down signal and the way i do it now because i had a guy drop right as i was saying that and i could have thought you know, if I had waited just a hair longer, a half second longer before I said down, then when I start to go, duh, and I start to give my down signal, that lift should already be 100% clear. That's yeah. that's the way I judge now, rather than if you you have to hold it through my down signal. I don't, as soon as I start to give the down, I want that to be a good rip. Yeah. You know, because... Uh, it's too easy to just blur that line like that guy. And I made him go back and do it because I was, you know, just starting my down and he dropped it. And that's why I thought, you know, if I, if I hold it long enough that when I start my down, it's a hundred percent good, then I never have to worry about that happening again as a judge. Yeah. Yeah. So I hope that makes sense. No, that makes perfect <laughs> sense. And, and, you know, and I always kind of thought there's, you know, maybe a little bit more leniency on on uh, events for reps, but yeah, you still don't want to be given one athlete. You know, one just giving one athlete sloppy reps and one being strict. Still, consistency and standard is is very important. But yeah, when it comes to world records, that's that's where my my pet peeve like really comes Absolutely. through is, is seeing, like you said, feet walking all over the place, head still back. Right, no eyes on the judge. Yeah, you know whatever. No, whatever no true do. demonstration of control. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And and <laughs> and where we are now with the uh, the weight is it's. Uh, I mean, like John has said, deadlifts. We're seeing soft knees. You know, shoulders still shrugged. Their hips aren't locked out. Um, you know, we're seeing presses that are <laughs> elbows are still bent, walking all over the place. And it's like you know we're we're talking about the a sport that claims to be the epitome of strength and and kind of domination across the strength sports. If we're going to say that, that, that the sport has a world record in something like the deadlift, man, it better be as solid as, as powerlifting deadlift. You know, I yeah. don't think it necessarily needs to be as, a, know, as an IPF deadlift, maybe not all powerlifting. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but I mean, you know what I mean? We, we should have some, some good standards there. So sorry about that. Yeah, no, oh, worries. no worries. But but hey, let's let's talk a little bit more about you, man. I mean, that's why we yeah. have you on here. So what are you know people want to want to hear? Um, <laughs> what I mean, what do you have plans for the future as competitions go? I mean, dude, dude, it's awesome that you came back. I think in what twenty one after like ten years. World strongest man. Yeah, I started yeah. competing again at the very end of twenty seventeen. It took oh, me did. okay. It took me three and a half years to get back to world strongest man. Oh wow. So, yeah. So, so that was kind of behind the scenes then maybe. <clears throat> or well, I, had, I, I guess I didn't recognize that you were back until World Stars Man, which is, you know, maybe shame on me. But um, yeah, in 2018, I started competing in Champions League again. 2019, okay. I won 
my first Champions League show of the year. And then two weeks later, I ripped my shoulder and mm. had to have my supraspinatus reattached. So that Ouch. took an entire year out of my training. Right. Uh, and then COVID happened. And then I started competing at the beginning of 2021 again. Yeah. Did a couple of shows. I did really well at a couple of shows. Got an invite to World's Strongest Man. Was probably, as far as deadlifts and squats go, was stronger than I've ever been. But I pushed so hard in training. I didn't have shit left for World's Strongest Man. I actually had strained my hamstring about 12 days before. Ouch. And then on the very first event, this was like a nice, you know, fuck you, welcome back to Worlds. Are you sure you want to be here? I tore <laughs> I tore a tendon in my finger and I ripped my hamstring. So I turned the oh, strain yes. into a tear and I ripped a piece of my uh, finger. So Damn. That was my very first welcome back to World's Strongest Man yeah. event. <laughs> yeah. And and forgive me, I I misspoke. I I knew you were back in SCL before. It just seems like it's not been quite that long ago. And maybe it yeah, was that year off right with now, COVID. Man. Yeah, maybe it was. Yeah, I like getting older, man. Like years just pass by. So, so damn quick. They do. They go faster. <laughs> they absolutely do. Yeah. <laughs> and I hear that's actually a. Uh, it's because you have more days to compare it to. So each day maybe. is a less significant portion of your entire life so they're just faster and smaller and, and yeah <laughs> i think it's, i think it's because life's more fun now and it's just like time flies when you're having fun that's could be I that <laughs> yeah life's pretty good right now man i'm not gonna yeah, lie <laughs> that's good man it's good to hear i mean I, I mean i don't know if you want to talk about it and you don't have to but i know you went through a little rough patch maybe not oh, a super yeah. rough patch after yeah. um it was I mean, you could talk about it if you want. I mean, I know people are interested to hear because you you really went through, I mean, it sounds I know a little bit about, about it. I've read a little. You went through some hell, but you've climbed out and come out the other side like uh, yeah. I, uh, a very positive, a very positive guy. And like you said, you're doing really well. Um, well, you know, the, the positivity and the gratitude actually saved my life because bitterness and uh, – you know, anger, anger and bitterness and, and just, I don't know, negativity uh, really is what, what started the spiral of my life going out of control and downhill. Uh, you know, but I think what really started all of that is, you know, we talked about uh, my intense nature of, with how I compete. Mm -hmm. I brought that to every competition and I brought it to every workout and whether I was injured or not feeling good, feeling sick, it didn't matter. I pushed through everything. And I think my body finally got to the point where it just said, you know what, man, we're done. We're freaking done. That's it. And it snapped. And with it went everything. Like my sanity went with it. And you know, the, the, Drugs came into my life. Meth came into my life. And that just sent it out of control even more. <clears throat> you know, it, uh, it was a really interesting, shitty, horrible, but interesting time to kind of think about how everything went down. You know, I, I had competed so hard for so many years, you know, from 2002 till 2000, basically till 2012. So 10 years of nonstop, you know, upwards of 18 competitions a year. And uh, <clears throat> in 2010, I broke my ankle halfway through the finals at World's Strongest Man. I competed through it. I kept going. I stayed on, made fifth place anyway. <clears throat> but then I went ahead and prepared for the Arnold the next year, you know, five months later or whatever it was. Then my ankle was still really messed up. I had to brace it every single, like a, a strapping, sure. a strap in and lace up brace every time I did anything physical. Uh, and then I competed at the Arnold, which is the heaviest show in the world. And I still took fourth. You know, yeah. we had like, a, I think it's like a 1100 pound frame carry that year, um, you know, with straps. It was just, it was miserable. And <laughs> I made it through that contest, but I was just broken. And at that point, Strongman was my only income. So my wife at the time told me I needed to keep competing so I could keep making money. And like a dumbass, I went ahead and did that. I, I should have just, after the Arnold, I should have stopped. 
and taking a year off, let everything calm down, let everything heal. And I probably would have come back with even more fire in the coming years. <clears throat> but instead, I kept beating my head against the wall. And gradually, I started to resent training. I resented competing. I hated strong man. I couldn't. It just was so burned out, so done with it. Uh, that I just, I couldn't lift weights anymore. I couldn't do it. I couldn't stand going to the gym. And, you know, that leaves a big hole in your life. You know, something that you've done your entire life that occupies so much of your time. Yeah. You take that out, that's a big gaping hole in your daily life. And uh, that vacuum sucks in usually the worst possible things that it can suck in. And, uh, you know, for me, I started, you know, drinking too much and then... <clears throat> Uh, I was I was addicted to painkillers at that time. That's uh, because I was pushing so hard. I was popping those all the time yeah. for about two years. Um, and that kind of made me distant from my wife at the time. So we grew apart and then ended up splitting up. And, and when that happened, you know, she took our son and moved to England. And uh, <clears throat> I was supposed to go to England, but that plan that, that rug got pulled out from under me and I, I was stuck by myself, you know, and, and just heartbroken, heartbroken, right. lost, <clears throat> you know, I, I had lost my passion for training. So I lost a huge chunk of myself already. I remember looking in the mirror and not knowing who, I, who was looking back at me. It was really a weird feeling. <clears throat> and then I lost, you know, my, my wife and my son, and then, uh, you know, I started to fall into, it was a descent into madness, basically, when crystal meth came into my life. And uh, it, that's when things really started to spiral out of control. So I lost my family. I lost my friends. I lost, uh, you know, basically everything. And over the course of about four years, I lost my house and, and everything else. Um, but about about six months before I got evicted from my house. You know, this was in the thick of, of meth addiction and being totally lost. I caught myself doing this, this negative list where I, and it was something that just popped into my head on a regular basis. Anytime I started thinking about anything, anything bad, or every time I went home, home was a big trigger. I'd pull up to my driveway and I'd just start thinking about everything I lost. You know, I lost this, I lost yeah. that, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, yeah, I was just about to, I was about to kill myself. I was pretty, I was done. And what stopped me was actually the thought of the poor bastard who was going to have to clean up my mess. And it started making me laugh. I'm like, what the hell are you, what do you give a shit? You know, <laughs> but I thought, well, I mean, if I guess if I give a shit about that, maybe I'm really not ready to do this. Let's put the gun down and just fucking settle the hell down. And, uh, I remember being pretty shaken up at that moment. And I, I, you know, I had my, my head in my hands and I'm sitting here, I'm thinking, you know, God damn, man, every, <clears throat> every time I think about this negativity, everything that's gotten me down, it seems to make the world worse. It makes my life worse. And I thought maybe if I try doing the opposite, I could start pulling myself out of this. And so I, I said, you know what, Travis, find one thing positive. Just find one thing. And I'm looking around my house at the time because I was still in it, but I was about to lose it. So that was, I was living on borrowed time at that point. So I was losing my house and I was surrounded by trash, just crap. You know, little things that I had collected. It's a meth head. I had shit everywhere. Stupid things. You know, a lot of things that I picked up when I drive around on trash night and I would fix them up and resell them, you know, like furniture or vacuums or, you know, little fans, any, any little electrical thing I could find, I'd fix it up and I'd sell it. So I had that shit everywhere and I'm looking around for something positive and all I see is this mess and I'm just surrounded by it. So I started going, God dang, man, <clears throat> my house is in trash. I'm about to lose my house. I'm about this, blah, 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 negative, negative, negative. And I said, that stop right there. Find one goddamn thing to be grateful for. And so I was about to give up and I put my head in my hands and I looked down and I see my feet of all things. I see my freaking toes move. 
and they were kind of beat up because I had been uh, I'd been shooting meth for a while at that point, and it kind of settles in your feet, and it, you know you have sores and shit, and it was they were messed up. But I moved my toes around, I flexed my calves, and I thought, well, you know what? I still got my own two feet. And with these feet, I, you know what? I've got two feet. I don't have to actually sit here. If I want, I could stand up and I could walk the hell out of this mess. And I got this surge of joy with that thought. Just kind of crept up. <clears throat> and it, uh, it felt so good. It was the first time I had felt any kind of happiness in years. And it was pure joy, man. It was powerful. <clears throat> and I kind of, I thought about that. And I thought about my feet and I just... You know, I hung out with that the rest of the day. Then I woke up the next day and I said, I want that feeling again. And so I started looking around, trying to find one another thing to be grateful for. And right away, I started thinking, oh, crap, my house is trash. I'm going to lose my house. This, that, there was that negative checklist again. <clears throat> so I cut it off and I found one more good thing. And this time I said, well, you got your hands, you got your feet. What about your hands? And I started looking at my hands and I thought, well, my hands were still strong, you know, with my hands and with my feet, I could go anywhere and I could do anything. And that surge of joy came back up. It was like this immediate feedback of me doing something right. And so the third day I found a third thing, fourth day I found a fourth thing on the fifth day, I didn't find a new thing. So I went back through my first four and now I have a list that became my fifth thing. <clears throat> now, instead of that <clears throat> negative list, I've got something I can fight that with. I got this gratitude list. So every time I started to say, oh, I've lost this, I lost that, I'd cut it off and I'd go, but I have this, I have that, I have this. <clears throat> and at every single time I would get that little sense of joy. You know, sometimes it was stronger than others, but it was there. And I thought, this is powerful. This is exactly where I need to go. <clears throat> and it took a long time to reverse that negative momentum. It took several months. It took until basically I was evicted from my house, but I had started to build some positive momentum. And so the house, at that point, the house had been like a prison. It was what, it, I wasn't gonna be able to leave it. I couldn't, I couldn't pull myself out of there. So I went ahead and I had myself evicted because I, by not paying for you know anything. So I knew I was gonna be forced out of it because that was the only way to get me out. And it worked. And I had this gratitude list that I could fall back on. I was armed with that. And that was, that was a really tough day when they kicked me out, yeah. you know, but on, in the back of my mind, I said, but this is freedom. This is what freedom feels like. I'm no longer a slave to that hell hole anymore. <clears throat> and so I, you know, I, I salvaged what part of my property, pieces of my property I could. I had a storage unit uh, and I lived in that storage unit for several months because I was trying to save money so I could move to Reno where my parents had moved to. Um, that was uh, October of 2015. I, I moved into that storage unit and Boxing Day, the day after Christmas was the day I ended up leaving. <clears throat> so it took all that time, about three months, to save up enough money to drive across the country <clears throat> and to do one thing that uh, I had to do, I had to get done before I could leave. I had this old Dodge Dakota, 2003. Every Dodge from that era got burnt up by the sun because something with the paint job was wrong. They all got burned up. And so somewhere in the middle of the, the tweaker haze, I thought it'd be a good idea to paint my truck. So I stripped it down. <laughs> And then I had two different colors of primer on it, but I never got past that. <laughs> so here I've got this in true tweaker fashion. You get halfway through a project, then you get sidetracked and want to do something else. <laughs> and that's that's where I was, man. So I had, I had just my self-respect. I had to paint my truck. <clears throat> I had a sprayer. I had some paint. I put uh, the first coat on it was gloss paint. Now, this is a beat-up truck, and when you put gloss paint on a beat-up truck, it shows every <laughs> nick and scratch and dent. It was awful. <laughs> so I, uh, I kind of smoothed it out. I sanded it down a little bit and uh, put a, a flat back black finish, flat back, flat black finish. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
and uh, it turned out pretty good, man. It, you know, it it looked surprisingly good, and that was <clears throat> that was like that was like a symbol of me being able to hold my head up and actually accomplish something, and then go out in the world <clears throat> and not look like a fucking reject. You know, that that was my symbol right there. And so I drove across the country and that paint job looked good. It held up for years. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, that that drive across the country was like my ride to freedom. You know, I stopped when I wanted to stop. I ate when I wanted to eat and I, I drove when I wanted to drive. I went to the Grand Canyon, spent a few days there. <clears throat> I actually pulled off of the Grand Canyon on New Year's Eve. It was pitch black. I pulled off to the side of the road to stop. And I was woken up New Year's Day 2016 by the sun coming up straight in front of me with a canyon laid out nice. in front of me. Nice. It was awesome, man. It was like a symbol of rebirth. And that whole trip, everything about that trip was symbolic. <laughs> but yeah, man, that was uh, that was kind of the beginning of, you know, beginning of the end and then beginning of the rise. Yeah. And uh, Dude, thanks for sharing that. I mean, that's uh, it's an amazing story. Uh, I know a lot of of us and our viewers are going through hard times, and and it's good to hear stories of of survival, man, and, and pulling out of the hard times and realizing that there is positivity in the world. Um, there's things to be happy for. There's things to be grateful for. Um, well, see, that's gratitude will change your life, man. It's like yeah. putting a new lens over your eyes. You see the same world, but it's totally different picture yeah. you know it, it's it's everything is the same but you see all the good instead right. of all the bad and it will yeah. literally change your life it's perspective life is perspective a lot of times absolutely man yeah and we can and we can i mean i think all of us are guilty of it and you know one time or another in our life to you know different extents but man it's easy to get a, get uh, caught up in the negativity and anger um you yeah. know anger anger is you know, I, I don't know how, how true of a quote it is. I think the Buddha said it was uh, anger is like drinking poison and expecting the other guy to die. That's exactly it. Hatred. Yep. Hatred. It just hurts you, man. And <clears throat> there's so much, so much else in the world to be uh, to live for, and and not not waste your life being angry at somebody because it's just hurting yourself. That's exactly it, man. That was something I thought about a lot during that time as well. A yeah. lot. Yeah. But, that's an amazing story, man. To uh, to go through that. I mean, meth. Uh, not a lot of people know that about me. I I had uh, uh, an experience with uh, drugs, like every drug imaginable, when I was a young man as well. <laughs> so I can actually relate very closely with uh, with the meth addiction. Um, and to be able to pull out of that and and turn your life around and, and come back and do what you love and do it well, is is truly amazing. So. Yeah, thanks for sharing that story. I feel I feel very amazing. fortunate, man. I you know, there's a lot of people, probably most people that go where I went that don't come back. Oh yeah. You know, and that's one of the things I want to show people is not only can you come back, but you can aspire to greatness. You know, you don't have to settle for some shitty job in a halfway house. Yeah. You know, you can aspire to be better than you've ever been. Nothing is holding you back except you. There will be road bumps for sure. Absolutely. But you're ultimately the one who can go as far as you want to go. 100%. That's my big thing now, man. Trying to what? trying to get that message across. 100%, man. I, I'm with you. I say that all the time. Like, you know, I was kind of reflect back on, you know, my mom and, and your mom, probably a lot of mothers say to children, you can be whatever you want to be. Right. And I mean, and I think there's a lot of truth to that to some extent. Obviously, you know, we're not all going to be billionaires and rocks and, and, uh, astronauts, but man, if you put your mind to it, you can accomplish a lot. Um, you can do great things. If you things. aspire to be a billionaire, maybe you end up a multi-millionaire. You know, exactly. I mean, you may fall short of your goal, but you're still way ahead of anyone else. Yeah, exactly, exactly, man. Uh, can't yeah. agree with that more. Because it it all builds up. It's like slowly. I think, like you said, the negative thing of I. Years ago, it would have been, yeah, a little over 10 years ago, had some really hard times. And it's weird because you don't realize how much like that trash and the anger and all the stuff you're doing 
just adds up. Like I remember just like not having time to throw out like liquor bottles and that became just leaving beer bottles all over the house and just like this utter mess. And I remember being so embarrassed when people came to help me move out of our apartment in Richmond, Virginia. Cause like, it was just like, it had just added up and you don't see it because each of those little things, it just becomes a normal thing you see in your day. And you don't realize how filthy it is until yeah. like you have people helping you and you feel awkward of you're like, Yep. I, I didn't realize how much this stacked up, but at the, the nice thing about that is the inverse is true of like, it's interesting looking at this podcast of like, here we are episode 38, but those little things add up. I was just talking to some people. They said our first episode, we didn't do an outro. Our intro was just a picture of the logo. And then just like Darren going straight into it. And like, we just did zoom calls. We just recorded it. The timestamps were there and those little improvements you make of like, I think trying to appreciate that journey, like the gratitude you said of like, you don't always realize how much progress you're making in life until you look back and you see how far you've come. Like your picture of the, that's why I love that trend on Instagram. The show me where, show me your bot, like where you came from the bottom and stuff oh, like that yeah. picture of you with like addicted and like struggling to you strong and like lifting. Now you that don't realize how was, far you've uh, come. But that picture was taken after the moment I talked about earlier. That was the yeah. moment. That was the day. That was the that was when the turnaround happened. I took that picture. I don't know why. I felt like I needed to. Mm -hmm. I felt like I needed to mark that moment. That was the day that turnaround happened. Well, that's huge. Because it is <laughs> like, it's really inspiring. And I think the hard thing is like, Darren said, and you said, not everyone makes it out. I remember visiting some friends who I had had during that time a year later and just being shocked at the condition of their house. Like I, in my mind, I was like, I don't remember it being this dirty. I don't remember it being this sketchy and like crazy, but like at the time you don't realize it because in your mind, you just think like you're so caught up in like the sadness of the anger that you're processing that nothing around you matters. And stuff like that point you said of not even be being able to look around and you don't see anything to be really happy about till you see your feet or something like that because it is like things do add up and i think people don't always realize that like those little steps like each time you do something out of anger or like drink or all those things like it adds up and everything so it's yeah. it's inspiring to see you come out of it because it is like that was the shocking part is to go back a year later and see some of my friends and just be utterly shocked that they lived like that. And I used to hang out there like three nights a week easily and just pass out on the floor sometimes. And I was like, that that floor was appalling. But you don't think <laughs> at the time. Like now I, I would never fall asleep on a floor. Like I, if I sleep wrong on my pillow, like my neck will bother me for like yeah. three days now. <laughs> and I remember back in the day, you would just like wake up wherever, like wake up on the roof sometimes, wake up like at the bottom of the stairs and just be like, oh, <laughs> just like bounce to it. So it's great hearing like that you've come through that. And I think it's still like, even now you talked about dealing with some pain, like your body is pretty beat up after 20 some years of doing it. Like that adds up. I've lived several lifetimes, man, and uh, yeah. I feel it some days. But some days, <clears throat> some days I feel really good. You know, I, <clears throat> I had a leg infection a couple years ago that almost yeah. killed me, mm. and uh, yeah. it 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 beat me up really bad. I had chronic pain for about two years, and then uh, I tried everything. I, I I had some improvement with a functional medicine doctor. Uh, Dr. Lacey Bonanzi, she, she helped me tremendously. Um, but I still had this chronic pain that was debilitating most of the time. And, uh, <clears throat> I was making slow, but steady progress, but I was still training. So it kept putting me back. And, you know, I, I'm talking when I, when I say I had chronic pain, if I tried to walk down a staircase, I had to hold on to the handrail because my legs would shake so bad mm. because everything hurt so much. Um, then I started working with a guy a couple of weeks, a couple of months ago now, and uh, his name's Alex Keichel. And huge difference, man. Huge difference. Uh, the chronic pain is gone. Nice. I, I feel great. I feel so good now. 
in fact, that I've actually started training hard enough to piss my hip off. And now I can't freaking <laughs> use my left leg because something's worn out in there and I got to get that fixed. But it's, you know, it's frustrating. I feel great everywhere. My heart feels good. My brain feels good. My shoulders, my body feels good. But my left leg <clears throat> is just, it, it's grinding at the moment and it's, it shuts everything down. I did a contest a couple of weeks ago where I basically didn't do anything because I could not put any pressure on my left leg. It was embarrassing, honestly. It was the worst performance I've ever had in a competition, period. And, uh, you know, when, when you get to my age, you get to 42, you've been doing this for 22 years, and you think, you know, all the things that I've been through, and this is, this is the rational side of me coming out and saying, I've, I've done a lot. I've done a lot, you know. I've I've done five Arnold Classics. I've done five World Strongest Man. Made the finals three times. And you've podiumed at Arnold, also three, yeah, third place yeah. twice, yeah, and fourth with a broken ankle. Yeah, and then it's, uh, it's fucking you know Fortissimus and doing all the contests that I've done. Going through the addiction I went through. It's like I've lived multiple lives very hard, like really pushed in each one of those lives. Yeah, <clears throat> but. I just don't feel ready to stop. I just not ready, man. I've got, I feel like I've got so much more to give. And that's why this uh, two years of this leg infection crap, you know, the, the post infection, whatever trauma or, or whatever you want to call it. It's been so frustrating because my heart is still in this yeah. so much. I still want to train. I still want to compete. I absolutely love it. <clears throat> but things have been holding me back and it, it makes me wonder, do I need to stop or is this just a chance to prove who I really am? And I'll call myself, you know, the comeback king. Well, this is just another chance to prove it in my mind. And uh, I'm going to keep fighting. I'm going to keep pushing. I'm going to keep doing everything I can literally until the fucking wheels fall off. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And I mean, I, there's a lot to be said about that, man. Um, like you said, people retire too, and 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 then they don't really retire, and they come back because the the fire's still burning, right? And yeah, I mean, don't 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 retire. Don't don't say you're going to retire. <laughs> just I go man. that way, man. You just you know, just keep going. It's I've seen so many guys. So I'm retired, and then they come back two years later. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> you can't, you know. Uh, I had a training partner who used to say he was retiring. You know, this is way back in like 2008. <clears throat> he would come in. He'd been to World Strongest Man. He was, you know, I'll, I'll keep his name out because I'm going to trash him a little bit. He uh, <laughs> he would come out and he'd say, oh, man, that's it for me. I'm retiring. I'm done with this. And I said, but <clears throat> you got to actually do something before you can retire. Right now, you're just quitting. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> that's just that's the mentality, man. You know, yeah. if, uh, if you're going to retire, it better be because you literally gave every freaking ounce of what you had to give. <clears throat> or yeah, otherwise, great. you know, just just don't say you love the sport as much as you say you love the sport. Yeah, I agree. But, I mean, that, that mentality, though, too, is why you've lasted so long. It's why you've done so well. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think that uh, – I certainly don't want to see you, see you retire. I mean, like I said, I'm very happy to see you back in the sport. <laughs> Uh, that was big news when you uh, when you made your appearance back in the sports. Like, dude, the sport was missing you big time. So no, I appreciate I, you saying that, man. That's dude, cool. <laughs> I mean seriously, man. I I'm, I've been a big fan for a very very long time. So, uh, um, yeah, man. I hope to see you do do big things. And you know, I'm a firm believer that uh, when you've got the the willpower to just push through and the desire, the passion, um, man. You again, getting back to what we said earlier, you can you can accomplish amazing things just with uh, that mind over matter kind of perspective. Well, the secret the, to life, the, the meaning of life is to find out what sets your soul on fire and let it consume you completely. Yeah. You will never be unhappy if you do what you love with every ounce of your being. Agreed. That's where I'm at. <laughs> Agreed, man. I mean, they say that too about like your occupation. Uh, if you do what you love, you'll never 
you'll never work a day in your life. Exactly. Right? Exactly. And now that gets my occupation is coaching. And yeah. uh, I absolutely love it. You know, I, I get to talk about weightlifting. I get to do weightlifting. I get to, you know, live and breathe my passion. And so that's why when I say life is good, I may be a train wreck at the moment. My body is killing me. I can't lift for shit. But life is good, man, because I get to have fun all day long, every day. Yeah, that's good. And and um, you own your facility. Is it the unit? Is that what it's? That was the uh, that was the old training that's grounds in Houston. Thing. Okay, my bad. Yeah. Now the unit. It, it wasn't a clever name. It was a storage unit. We just shortened yeah. the unit. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> there you go. But it was it, it made some world class athletes, man. We had three guys go to World Strongest Man. We had two guys who were alternates, and we had some of the top amateurs. We even had a masters competitor who was a six time national champion. Nice. My dad. Yeah, hell yeah. You know, we we had some tough guys. It was it was savagery out there. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, I mean, where do you train now? I train at a place called American Iron in Reno, Nevada. Nice. Okay. It's, uh, I feel spoiled. Let's put it that way. It's a long way from the old storage unit. Yeah. I can imagine. I can imagine. <laughs> it's, it's actually one of the best facilities. A definite top five facility that I've ever been to. They've got, you know, Olympic lifting, bodybuilding, powerlifting, an entire room of power racks, 10 power racks and five oh, monoliths wow. with platforms and benches. And that's just one of the rooms. Nice. You know, it's uh, it's a it's an awesome, awesome place. That sounds amazing. And you coach just uh, do you primarily coach powerlifters and strongmen or do you have uh... mostly I've got okay. some general fitness. I like doing the general fitness because I've got a guy who checked in today. He was 397 pounds when we started. He is 341 pounds nice. today, and we're 19 weeks in. Hell yeah. Yeah, he's gotten way stronger. He couldn't even squat the bar when we started. He's up to 315 now. Nice. And, uh, Hell yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, just doing shit like that. That's, yeah, I love, you know, competitive athletes. But when you change someone's life like that, or actually, you just open the door for them to change their life themselves. That's that's incredible. That's so much fun, man. I love doing that. <clears throat> that's awesome. It's, yeah, ahead, it really is. I think like it's interesting you talk about that idea of like <laughs> watching people unlock their own potential. Like it's interesting to like watch people start to trust themselves and to like believe that they can move things and stuff. That's exactly Cause it. Because you see yeah. that fear of like realizing of like struggling to squat the bar is like that's a big deal and then at that point you probably couldn't even fathom trying to do eight times that way ten times that way oh yeah yeah you're trying to squat the bar and then you realize it's just meant to hold more weight yeah <laughs> it's, it's meant to hold purpose. the real big circle like, yeah exactly that's that scary seen. shit man but you know when 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 you see that self-confidence grow when you see the, the light come on when they start to see some changes and they start to see, you know, the numbers on the scale drop or, or change, you know, they, their clothes start fitting differently. That's, <clears throat> that is so much fun to me. I absolutely just, I, I can't say enough about it. I love it. Yeah. Cause it's a, it sounds like a really great way to like give back and everything. Cause it is like, it's neat seeing those competitive athletes and stuff. I was going to ask, since you've been doing it 22 years, how like how do you think training and gyms and everything compare now to at the beginning? Because it feels like things are so specialized now. Like it's, 22 years ago, you wouldn't have like these niche gyms that are. It's a whole there. different world, man. It's a whole different world. <clears throat> you know, and, and part of it, at least for the therapy tools, <clears throat> CrossFit had a huge impact because oh, yeah. crossfitters were beating themselves up so bad doing horrible form on Olympic lifts <laughs> for uh, massive reps. Yes. But they started implementing all of these therapy tools, you know, the, the, the rollers and the, the little knobby balls and the yep. sticks. And <clears throat> so I thank CrossFit for being so brutal on its people that that became a big part of the industry. But when it came to strongman, most people, only knew world's strongest man. They didn't know there were any other levels to strong men. Like I didn't. I remember when my training partner at the time mm -hmm. came up to me and said, you know, I want to do a strong man competition. And immediately I'm thinking like world strong. What, 
like those guys on TV, we'll never be that strong. What are you fucking crazy? <laughs> and then nevertheless, he found a, a Texas strongest man, an amateur level contest. And so we had to drive six hours north of Houston to the border of Oklahoma and Texas. And uh, it was August 2nd, 2002. It was hotter than hell. And when we got there the night before, <clears throat> he was signing in and the promoter actually looked at me and said, hey, man, you're here. Why don't you sign up? And I thought about it. You know, what the hell? He's right. I'll give it a shot. <clears throat> and then, uh, you know, just just as a sorry, a little sidetrack here. But that contest changed my life. It completely changed my life. I had so much fun. I had more fun doing that than I'd ever had doing anything my entire life. Period. Hands down. I was on this straight and narrow path through college. I was really good in college. I had academic awards. I had honors credit. I was going to biotechnology. And then Strongman came, and it suddenly diverted a completely <laughs> different direction. And I actually, I was going to take a semester off. And that semester was, uh, got 21 years ago, 22 years ago, 21 years ago. And uh, so I'm on the, you know, the 30-year program to graduate college. <laughs> Better late than never. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it when we started, when we wanted equipment, we either had to steal it from a construction site or we had to find some fabricator or steal pieces from a construction site, take them to a fabricator and have him put it all together. You know, there weren't any directions on how to do any homemade stuff. Right. <clears throat> there weren't any, just as a quick example, we had some farmer's implements, but the pipe was too small for regular clips to fit. So what I came up with was duct tape the end and the weight is stuck on forever, but it doesn't come off. <laughs> and now, you know, it's so simple that th there's so many ideas and so many people doing this. All you need is a spring clip, yeah. you know, just one of those you can get at Home Depot for a dollar. And I never even thought about those things, but that's what guys <laughs> nowadays don't have to worry about. Right. Because they have clips that fit. They have tools that are meant to have weights on them, you know, and then you could go to almost any gym any any like home gym or, or uh, not home gym, but like <clears throat> not a commercial gym. And uh, they're going to have some kind of strongman equipment. Oh, yeah. Generally speaking, you know, lots of them have a log. They'll have, uh, you know, different bars for powerlifting stuff. A yoke. Most will have some farmers. Yeah. You know, obviously all, all your CrossFit gyms nowadays. Fitness. All your CrossFit gyms nowadays have yokes, farmers, Atlas exactly. stones, sandbags. Exactly. Not, maybe not always a log, but there's an axle, axles. Yeah, they use all that stuff. Yeah, my first set of stones was actually the grandfather of that promoter in my first competition. He's a 75-year-old man. He was a concrete worker his whole life. He was selling stones for 50 cents a pound. So I drove nice. six hours mm -hmm. one way to load my truck up and drove home the same day, <laughs> you know, with 1,100 pounds of weight oh. in the back of it. <laughs> man, that, yeah, made, that's that back end was sagging low, I bet. <laughs> oh, it was, man. It was. I drove slow on the way home. But that's what it took, you know. And it, I loved it that much that I was willing to sacrifice yeah. that much time to make it happen. You know, I think there's a lot of people that are training now that probably wouldn't be training if they didn't have the equipment readily available. You know, yeah. they're spoiled. Yeah, I don't think you're wrong there. I mean, I think there has been a bit of a shift in the, the mentality or the um, – yeah, I don't know. I guess the mentality of, of the competitor nowadays, because like I like you said, I think they are spoiled. I mean, I remember having to carry I, I used to have to load load my my yoke up, which was a pretty big, beefy 500 pound yoke. Oh, man. Um, you know, I had to load up my pickup, take it to the gym. And the gym was in an old uh, like Safeway or uh, Target, actually, I think it was. And the weight was in the far corner of the gym. And I had to carry it all the way to the other far corner outside. Right. Yep. <laughs> and, and, and load everything up, like put my yoke together, load it up, train, break it all down, put the weight back and, you know, oh, take yeah. my yoke back. Up. <laughs> right. That was training, I remember but, those days, man. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. yeah. You don't see that very often anymore. We are kind of spoiled. <laughs> no, man. What I get, what I get a lot of times is, you know, as a, a question when you're promoting a show is, what height is the farmer's handles? Is it 15 inches or 16 inches? Who gives a Who shit? Cares? Just come in strong. strong. Yep. Like 15 or 16. <laughs> doesn't matter. What size is the stone? Is it 21 or 19 and a half or 20 and a half? 
It's a half fucking inch. It's a rock. Pick it up. <laughs> Jesus Christ. You come, this is one of the reasons I love Champions League. Yes. You don't even know the freaking events sometimes. Right. You show up with your truck pull shoes, your overhead press shoes, and your moving shoes. Yeah. And then you just compete. And one elbow sleeve. And one elbow sleeve. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, one elbow sleeve. Uh, I, I've competed at SEL, so I, I know the I know the I know the gig. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I actually got away with two elbow sleeves on a Viking press in my last competition with them. Oh. But that's because I've got a pinched nerve that's shutting down one arm and a rebuilt yeah. shoulder on the other. So they, they gave it to me. Just tell so, uh, so Uncle both of my elbows are injured, man. <laughs> That's exactly what it was. I'm like, look, man, Ilka, you know me. You know, I'm not going to try and cheat the system, but uh, give me a break, pal. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> oh, man. It so, go ahead, John. Sorry. Yeah. I was like, it is crazy how specific things are. And I had never thought of that, that CrossFit really, like, innovated all this recovery stuff. Because now you have, like, cryo, you have compression therapy, you have yeah. all that stuff. And it's interesting because you realize that is a huge part of it. Like you oh, had yeah. suddenly you had a massive part of the population just training insane on things. So like it's it's a still really? astounding to me to see people like you're like just getting into lifting and you're just snatching like 135. Like that seems like a pretty intense thing for if you've never done real fit. Yeah, especially like, if you're doing 25 it. reps of it or some shit like yeah. that. <laughs> or, yeah, because you do snatches like that for like sets of five and then bur five burpees and then some yeah. kipping pull ups. So your shoulders are just real loose and just, <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> it's crazy. But it is and, like, you know, the other thing was uh, like the, the su uh, not supportive, well, supportive equipment. Yeah, because you get sleeves and all that stuff. But bands have become so easy to get. You get them anywhere now. I called Louis Simmons himself and ordered my first set of bands. Yeah, he was the only one in America that was selling them at the time, <clears throat> and well, I had kind to, of the he's kind of back. the inventor of of that entire method. So, well, sense. he took it from uh, uh, what's his name? Oh, uh, there was a guy who pioneered the band training. Oh, because I thought it was um, Simmons, and then Louis took it from him. Uh, okay, God, Donnie Thompson talks about him sometimes. Uh, his name is escaping me and that's, I should be able to give him credit. I, I feel so bad now, <laughs> but he, uh, he pioneered the band and that whole accommodating resistance. And then Louis refined it and took it to another level, complete whole nother level. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, I mean, again, I mean, we talk about the, the way gyms have changed. It's hard to go into any, any kind of CrossFit gym, powerlifting gym, strongman gym now, and not see influences of Westside everywhere. Oh, yeah. I mean, oh, there's yeah. entire conjugate um, training systems now that are designed for every every kind of training imaginable, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then you look at some power racks. If they have the holes that are spaced kind of wide, and then as it gets to the center, they get yep. – Yep. Half as wide. That's Westside's West Side. yep. powerlifting. That was their design. Yeah. You know, a lot of people look at a power rack and won't know that. Yeah. You know, like just right down to the nuts and bolts to uh, you know the the platforms with hooks that you can attach bands to. Yeah. This is why we need you in the sport and people like you because <laughs> there's, there's all this information that would be lost like if, if you weren't here. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that'll be my next role is to uh, be a grand wizard of strongman or some shit. There you go. There you go. The the grand historian. We we need one of those. I mean, we go. I mean, we've got Andrew Clay. I would like to put you against Andrew Clayton and see who knows strongman more, actually. Yeah. You know who would probably beat both of us is Dave Ostland. Oh. Ooh. Dave Dude, Ostlin. It, I don't know did. about his recent knowledge, but his his knowledge from 2010 and before. Yeah. He was one that he would ask you a question. Who wore a yellow shirt in the finals of the 99 <laughs> oh, World yeah. Strongest Man? And he'd know the fucking answer. That's nuts. Yeah. <laughs> Man, I, I miss seeing Dave Ostlin, too. Uh, I actually had the opportunity to train him with him a couple of times. Really? Uh, a long time ago. Yeah, because I so I started Strongman back in uh, Fargo, North Dakota. Uh, oh, okay. And so we were not too far from 
Jackal's gym and we'd make a trip over there every now and then. And, and, you know, we'd run into Carl Gillingham. Yep. He was one of, he was one of my original, you know, guys I looked up to. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And they were regular judges on, on the amateur circuit up in that area as well. Nice. Dave and Carl. Yeah. You know, I actually said something to him that <clears throat> it's kind of bittersweet. It's uh because it comes back to me now. I remember looking, going up to him and saying, oh, hey, Carl Gillingham, it's great to meet you. I watch you all the time when I was growing up. Now I got people coming to me and saying, hey, it's great yeah. to meet you. I watched you all the time when I was a kid. I'm like, fuck you, man. I'm not that old. <laughs> I'm not that old. <laughs> now I know what those guys were feeling when That's I was awesome. saying it to them. Like, God yeah. damn it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're not that old. I mean, you're younger than I am, and I'm not old. I don't feel old. It's not like, again, you know I mean? Time is going to catch up with us no matter what, but, I mean, it, there's still – there's still time to look at age as a as kind of perspective, right? Yeah, it's a state of um, mind. It's a state of mind. You know, eventually you can't your state of mind isn't gonna be able to deny the fact that you're getting old, but but while you can while you can deny it, man, deny the fucking hell out of it. Yeah, that's exactly it, man. <laughs> my influence is my dad. I got him into into just lifting when he was fifty six. And then I did that strongman contest I was talking about earlier, and I came yeah. back and I said, Yo, pops. You got to try this shit. He was 58 when he started Strongman. And so he competed wow. until he was 69. Nice. Yeah. yeah. I think he is the oldest to have ever competed in a Strongman competition. Jeez, I know he's amazing. the oldest to have won a national championship. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> that's amazing. I didn't know because, I mean, O did like basically 50 to 60, right? Yeah. He was still competing with us at like 60 years old, I think. Yeah. Because he's a few of... years younger than my dad, like three years younger. But he was, I think he was 60, 61 when he still competed with us. And then I know he's had a hip replacement. And he hasn't done any strongman since, but he still does all that grip stuff. Yeah. And he's got a, a phenomenal grip. Dude, didn't he do like, what was it, like his 65th birthday or something like that? He he picked the, the blob up like 65 times, just one yeah. after another. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's that's exactly what he could do, man. That's yeah. freaking unbelievable strength. Man. Unbelievable. <laughs> unfreaking believable. Yeah. He's because he's definitely it's crazy, like his grip still, like watching him like go against like modern influencers and everything now. He's still like recently had a video of like people challenging him to grip and everything. Oh, yeah. He can just destroy everyone. Like Juji Mufu, I think, was like oh, one yeah. of the last videos I saw. And it's crazy to just watch him like the Saxon bar and stuff just lifted like it's nothing. Or just this like pinch and he's like because that hub, like all those grip things are just so brutal. Like it's crazy when you realize like trying that, that like a two and a half pound plate can be the difference between picking oh. it up easily and just it's glued Dude, to the floor. Putting a half pound, half pound plate, when your grip goes, it goes. It's a weird thing. It's just, especially those pinch grips, you know, it, it, a half a pound can make all the difference on that. It's yeah. just really kind of frustrating because you could lift, you know, let's say a hundred pounds and it feels really good. And then you go up to one Oh one and it just <laughs> kicks your ass. <laughs> so your grip is so frustrating, but, but I mean, these are the guys that are, that are paving the way forward that, that in, in our golden years, there's something to still look forward to in, in the strength world. Um, I think that there's a possibility to be great and do and continue improving on something strength related till, till the toes are up, man. I, I was kind of thinking the same thing, you know, even, even after you've been busted up, you got hip replacements and, and stuff like that. It, there's still something to work towards. Yeah, you know, and on the uh, on the subject of hip replacements, it's something I've been doing a lot of research on lately, because it kind of seems like it's an, an inevitability for me. I don't know when, but sometime. And I'm trying. If you've heard of anybody that's done more, let me know. But I'm trying to figure out what the maximum weight that a hip replacement can hold. Aaron so Fondry, far, huh? Aaron Fondry. That's just who had... I'm talking about. Two hundred and eleven pounds did an eight hundred pound yoke. Yep. That's the most I've heard of so far. And he said he wasn't worried about it at all. And so. he's an under 90 
hell, he might even be under 80 now. I don't know. Kilogram. But I mean, he's a he's a under 200 pound competitor for sure. Yeah. Uh, incredibly powerful guy. He's come back from hip replacement surgery so quickly and, and yeah. just dude, unbelievable. That's who I, I spoke with him at length a couple of days ago. And uh, <clears throat> the, the only issue is he is an under 90 competitor and he was doing an 800 pound yoke. I'm 130 pounds heavier than him. Probably going to need to do a thousand pound yoke. So if we've got a thousand pounds on his hip replacements, do we think they can hold another 300 pounds more? And I'm scared to get a hip replacement because I'll be going where no man has gone before. I, I will test the limits. Yeah, well, that's the thing. And that's the thing with like surgery. I mean, even even bicep surgery. I was, you know, I had a detachment and by like week, like six weeks post-op, I pulled like a beltless deadlift double overhand PR. Nice. And, and nice. um and I go in and I told the PA and you know she's freaking out goes gets the surgeon and he comes back and he's like you know you're doing things that we have no idea is possible because all the data we have is based on pretty much just average people normal people that's we, exactly so, it so we always yeah. take they always take a very conservative approach to recovery and what you should actually do post operation but he's like we have no idea really what the capability is and i'm sure it's the same with hip replacement surgery yeah no, nobody well, really knows it was the same with my my shoulder surgery i the surgeon actually trains at my gym i talk to him all the time and i told him one day i said hey doc i i think i ripped my super spinatus off and he kind of laughed and he said oh well get an mri we'll see we'll look at it he didn't believe that i knew exactly what happened and then sure <laughs> enough he gets the mri and goes hey man good guess yeah and doc at What's this point, it ain't a guess, man. <laughs> but he said, I asked him, I said, if I get this surgery, am I ever going to be 100% without hesitation? So, oh, no, 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 no. You, you, you won't. You, you got to be easy on it. You got to be careful with it. <clears throat> and that just didn't sit right. Yeah. And now this is the best feeling joint I've got in my entire body. And, you know, I've pressed upwards of like 380 with it. Uh, a 205 pound dumbbell circus dumbbell so i know it can hold more yeah and i think he just had no idea what the capabilities were of the surgery because you know it's got anchors and pins and then it's sure you know but uh i heal really well and that's because of a lifetime of lifting yeah so there is that factor <laughs> well and i think too i mean healing and they don't talk about this either when you get surgery um you know the orthopedic surgeons they just don't know and, you know, when I tore my bicep, again, I had that same fire. Like, I'm not, this isn't going to stop me. I'm not going to slow down. I kept training. You know, I took probably a week off post-surgery because, I mean, I was so drugged up, I couldn't lift anyway. Um, <laughs> right? But, I mean, I stopped taking my, uh, whatever they gave me, like Oxycontin, like all these just crazy drugs. And I'm like, and they were making my stomach just, I couldn't eat. And so I stopped yeah. taking them and I found out that I didn't have any, enough pain to really justify being on them anyway. And I just went back to the gym and started training unilaterally. And yeah. And, and what happens, there's actually good research that, sh that shows that unilateral training during uh, injury will limit the hypertrophy. Uh, I'm sorry, the uh, atrophy rather yep. of the injured limb. And so that's what I focused on. And I just kept training. And I came exactly back and, what I did. I came yeah. back and started hitting overhead PRs, you know, within eight weeks post-surgery. I was, you know, dropping the bar, but um, taking out of a rack, dropping it on, on the ground. But, yeah, they just don't know. And I think a big factor in your ability to recover is, is that mindset, like the passion to keep pushing, like to not let something bring you down. Um, and the yep. will to just, like, just keep pushing forward. I think there's a lot of power there. Um and, and, and I think, um, you know, guys like you and, and athletes and like strength athletes in general, going out and proving that the, the, the science is it really conclusive. Uh, well, you know, I took the, huge. uh, I took the lessons that I learned climbing out of hell yeah. and I applied them to my surgery recovery, you know, finding purpose, finding positive things to, to focus on. <clears throat> and for me, what helped me stay positive was I turned my left side into a game. I thought, you know, let's, let's find out new PRs, one arm circus dumbbell clean and yeah. press one arm deadlift. And then when I was able to move this arm, 
or I, I wasn't even able to move it. Uh, when I was allowed to freely move this arm without lifting anything, I remember taking my hand, I had to put it up on a yoke, and then I pulled it off with a crossbar, and my arm just dropped. That was week one of, it was actually week six, but it was the first week of me trying to yeah. no longer drop down but come back up. <clears throat> the second week, I was able to slow my hand down. I couldn't stop it. The third week, I caught it about two-thirds of the way down. And then, you know, by like the fifth week, I was able to hold my arm out straight and, and actually raise it up and down. So mm -hmm. it was it was <clears throat> focusing on where I was currently and not where I'd been in the past. Because yeah. in the past, I'd hit, you know, 420 axle overhead. I hit 240 for reps on circus dumbbell. And now here I am. I can't even put my own hand over my head. <clears throat> so I just, I wrote down post-surgery PRs. And now all of a sudden, I've, I've got this list of wins each week. You know, you, you start snowballing. You start building up momentum of wins. Each week is a win. Each week is a new PR. That's yeah. huge for your mental game. 100%. Oh man, it, it was it's what carried me up to worlds because that tear happened in 2019, and it wasn't until you know 2021 that I got invited to World's Strongest Man, and I felt that was the best feeling joint in my whole body at that point. Yeah, <laughs> it, and it's amazing. Like I'm, I'm, I mean, different injury, obviously bicep versus uh, super spinatus, but um, man, I have nothing but problem. I, I kind of. Wish this one would tear now too, so that it would yeah. feel as good as this one. <laughs> I, I know the feeling, man. I, got, I tore my right one and my left one. It, it kind of tweaks every now and then. Yep. Same fucking deal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like you know. I always tell everybody, it's not. You know, I wouldn't recommend it, but it's not the worst injury in the world. And uh, yeah. No, well, you're not. I, I was told a long time ago, you're not a real strong man until you've torn one bicep at least. Yep. yep. <laughs> it's not. It's not an if. It's a when. If you're really serious in strong man. If you're in it long enough, it's not an if, it's a win. You'll tear that's, myself. That's exactly it. Yeah. That's, yeah. <laughs> and now I've torn, I've torn, I had to have this one reattached, but I've torn both of them at the top oh. and mm -hmm. this one at the bottom as well, just not complete tears. So I've torn all four sections sure. of my biceps. So I must yeah. be a real, real strong man. Yeah, yeah. Proximal's <laughs> bad. They don't like to fix the proximal. I don't think there's a really good fix for proximal. I always talk to people that have had full detachments. And they're like the orthos say that there's yeah. really not much they can do. It's a it's a ten percent loss in strength anyway. I was lucky. Yeah. I didn't detach the tendon. I just kind of ripped the belly a little bit. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, yeah. I, I and I've heard that the the distal end, like Bobby Thompson, I think he's torn both ends of one of his. I don't I don't know how you do that. I I don't know how it even functions enough where you can tear it from the top. Yeah, but uh, I know one of his arms is a mess, and I think all he's got left is the brachialis underneath. Oh wow! You know that's that's the only thing that's really extending his arm. But thankfully, he's already built up a lot of strength in that arm. It didn't affect him very much. Sure, <laughs> it's crazy. Like I know people that they have like full detached uh, proximal tendons, and they still have full functionality of their their arm. And I mean, yeah, and, and they're not really that much stronger. It's pretty amazing what the human body can uh, withstand and keep keep going. It really is, man. It it is amazing what compensations and things that the human body will do to keep going. It it is amazing because I've I've torn and broken almost everything in my body. I've got compensations for compensation. <laughs> I mean, they're they're layered up, but it just it keeps going. And I find ways. All you got to do is not be stubborn. And if you got to switch your your technique a little bit, you just switch it a little bit. Yeah. Otherwise, you try and you you try your best to keep proper form and to keep proper bar path. But if you need to open one side up because it's just not working in here, yeah. then then do it. The body sure. will find a way. Yeah. Dude. <clears throat> yeah. Because it really is like we are, we heal really. Like it's incredible what the body can do. And I think the interesting point Darren made is I think oftentimes like people don't realize that sometimes – the biggest mistake you can make when you're injured is like painkillers make it hard to eat. You need to eat to recover in general, just even without an entry, but not being able to eat properly. And then a lot of people just stop moving. Like they just like yeah. just lay down in bed or sit on the couch. And it's like, so you're not eating properly. Yep. 
on painkillers and you're not moving like you're stagnant yeah yep. stagnation is honestly like one of the worst things that can happen to people yep and stuff like we're designed yeah, 100%. To be that's where atrophy happens right your body just starts kid to cannibalize itself and mm. and that's the worst thing for recovery yeah yeah because then it's not building up it's just tearing down it's just... exactly <laughs> exactly yeah exactly. It, you know it, it's amazing what blood flow will do you yeah. know and, and i've got this this saying that the body will heal if given the means to do so no matter what it is it will always heal if given the means to do so it just we have to figure out what those means are and i realize you can't grow a new arm back but you could if you are given the means to do so and as your arm is stitched back on yeah you can heal from that you know and then a lot of people they they baby whatever it is they've hurt you know they they twist an ankle and they limp for months right and that's almost the worst thing you could do for an ankle it, it, if you work through that pain and you keep your motion it heals faster it actually does a lot better yeah. if you if you work through it not everything's like that but everything benefits from some degree of movement and then always an increase in blood flow yeah every and, time well an inflammation in general is the body's response to healing and you know i i, I have this conversation all the time and it, people have this obsession with trying to eliminate inflation uh, uh, um inflammation now obviously there's a point where you know, too much inflammation can impede your movement. And, and obviously yeah. I think in the calves, you, you have a concern of blood clotting and whatnot. But um, for the most part, most of your inflammation is a good thing. You shouldn't be trying to limit it. Um, you know, and, and that's where I kind of argue a bit against the, I know the whole like ice bath thing has made this huge resurgence recently. <laughs> and I think there's probably some benefits to some extent, but um trying to eliminate yeah. that inflammation is trying to eliminate the the body's healing process you're gonna you're gonna stall process. you're gonna stall out on on recovery yeah you're gonna stunt your growth uh i think it was lane norton actually talked about a study yeah. <laughs> where there seems to be a proper level of inflammation yep he was talking about older athletes having already higher chronic chronically higher levels of inflammation yep. can benefit from taking very small amounts of anti-inflammatories after a very intense workout. But if they take too much, they, they limit the inflammation too much. Yep. And, and, you know, whereas a younger athlete may, if they took a tiny amount of Advil or whatever, they would get to this point very easily yep. and they would limit the amount of inflammation and stunt their growth. Yeah. And then the ice baths is a very similar thing because it kind of flushes that inflammation through. Um, but if it's, I think it takes about four to six hours for your body to get that maximum of effect from the inflammation. And so the best way to do an ice bath is first thing in the morning and then, you know, either go train afterward 30 minutes later or train later in the day and then take a hot shower after yes. your workout. Yep. <clears throat> that's, that's, that's actually what I've been doing and it definitely helps. Yeah. I'm a big fan of the hot saunas, hot baths. Um, like I like a really just brutally hot, like immersion bath. Yeah. Uh, especially <laughs> for recovery. I mean, I do a little bit of ice here and there. Like I'm not opposed to it completely, but like you said, timing is everything. Um, yep. Yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, I feel so much better after a hot bath, especially when you have like tight, sore muscles, muscles respond better. I think to heat the blood flow, right? Yeah. Where ice is going to constrict the blood flow. Um, you need those nutrients in the blood to flow, uh, to be moving through your, your muscles to, to recover. <laughs> and so, yeah, exactly. ice has always been a weird, kind of a weird thing to me. Now I know there's some new research out now that suggests that, you know, there's all kinds of benefits to like lowering heart rate and caloric burn and all of this stuff. But, uh, I, I'm still a firm believer that, you know, well, for me, I'm going to do whatever I think feels good. Right. <laughs> and yes, it doesn't enough, make me man. feel good. <laughs> yeah. I, I will say, I love, uh, I love the cold first thing in the morning. That, yeah. that is, it's an awesome way to start your day. It clears your mind. It, it focuses you. And then uh, I also do some breath work. I'll, I'll turn the shower to completely cold. 
uh, actually I've started with hot and then I do 50 breaths, breathe out, hold my breath. Then I turn it to cold and then I'll do two more cycles of 50 breaths with, a, you know, I hold my breath on the out as long as I can. Uh, that's kind of a Wim Hof thing. Yeah. Uh, that's old I, school, man. I don't yeah. recommend if you guys want to try that, I don't recommend doing that kind of breathing in the shower your first time. I would do that, you know, seated or laying down and make sure that you're not going to pass out because ah, uh, right. shower's a bad place to pass out. Yeah, <laughs> it can be. Because I'm a big fan of that and everything. And I think people don't always realize what it is, is the obsession with cold showers. People don't realize it's not the cold that's helping you. It's actually the flush that happens once you get out. It's your body reheating that like actually flushes everything and helps the circulation. So I think people have this obsession that they're like, it's the cold that's helping. Whereas ideally the best thing you can do, like you said, is do something cold in the morning, but then try to work out within a few hours of that. Cause it's actually that flush that happens afterwards and stuff. And I the Wim Hof. Yeah. I haven't personally done the workout shortly after the cold shower. Cause I'm not a, an early morning workout kind of person. Oh, I just, I, I need a few hours. I'm like a freight train. It takes me a while to get going <laughs> and then it takes me a while to stop. You know? <laughs> yeah, <nice. laughs> but I, that's, I don't, that's I don't like my coach says uh, the 78, uh, the 78 uh, VW bug, right? That's what he always calls me. He's like, it takes me forever to warm up. But once you get going, you don't know, stop. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's it, man. That's exactly it. I'll take the analogy of a freight train. You keep yeah, the bug. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. mm, the adolescent monster truck. The, the That's all I can think <laughs> <laughs> Oh man. Well, hey, we, we usually like to keep these about an hour, Travis. We're okay, which is good. We're spilling over. It's all good. But dude, it's been great having you uh, again. Uh, I think this is going to be a great episode for everybody here. I really appreciate you coming on board and, you know, being vulnerable enough to to talk about your, you know, hardships and coming out of that and, and you know, the, the positivity that you found in life, uh, I think is going to help a lot of people. Uh, it definitely is very inspiring. And I, and I thank you so much for sharing your story uh, and coming on. I appreciate you yeah. having me on, man. Great conversation. Yeah, yeah it's been a lot of fun, brother. I love it. It's been great. This was actually, Darren said this was one of the first ones that he got kind of giddy and nervous for. <laughs> so 38 times is pretty good cool to like have this happen. That's awesome. Because, yeah, it was like as soon as you were excited about it and everything, so many people were reaching out and stuff when they heard because it is like it's a big deal and you are like such a down-to-earth person. Like I've appreciated this hugely and everything. It was nice of like you showing up and everything because overall i think like your message of the gratitude was so important and everything that like sorry that you just keep moving forward and everything even if things hurt like find something to feel good about well that's it's you know that i read a book called ultra marathon man uh dean carnese's guy that runs ultra marathons and it's it's really made me think lately that life is similar to an ultra marathon, especially an athlete's life, because the first part, like running the first marathon is nothing for him. That's just getting warmed up for the next part of the race. And so we, we warm up with his first marathon and then we, you know, as an athlete, you do something great. You really build up that runner's high and then something happens and you come crashing down. And same thing with this, you know, at mile 50, you start crashing and then you kind of trudge through that, that valley and you come to the next runner's high and that's the comeback. And, you know, a lot of people, <clears throat> they don't make it to that because they think, well, shit, once they get down here, this is really hard. This is really hard. I'm, I just want to go back to being easy. And they start walking rather than they keep on running. They, they quit. But if you keep going, you get to that next high and that next peak is a little better, but it's a little shorter. And then you come back down, you crash even harder and you crash a little longer. And then that's when most people, that's when anybody who didn't give up the first round will give up usually at this point. <clears throat> and then you go through like three or four more of those and you get to where I've gotten. The peaks are even higher, but they're really fucking short and the valleys are 
awful. They're just like this last one has dragged on for <clears throat> two freaking years. Yeah. <clears throat> but I feel like I'm starting to make it back up. I'm feeling the beginning of a new peak. And I can't yeah. wait to see how high this one gets. Yeah. But he said that the trick is you just keep putting one foot in front of the other. And if you can make it through and you have faith that you've got that next mm -hmm. high coming, that next peak coming, you just keep putting one foot in front of the other. And that's all you focus on. It'll come. So right now I'm putting one foot in front of the other and I'm staying focused on that because I know the next peak is coming. Yeah. And that's where I'm at. Yeah, man. I'm, I'm with you. I can, I've been saying lately, cause I, you know, we all go through shit. Um, and the older you get, I think the more, you know, for me, I realize is that life is hard and it, and it gets harder. Right. And you have to be able to look back. You have to be able to look back and say, you know what? I've been through some hard shit. I can do this too. Well, there's something cool to know. You know, there's something about <clears throat> knowing how hard you are to kill. Yeah. There's a power in that, you know, there's sure there something is. to that. <laughs> yeah, man, exactly. I've been through some hard shit. I, this isn't going to, this isn't going to kill me. Cause that didn't kill me. That's you exactly know? it, man. Yeah, yeah. I'm tough as shit to kill. I'm a goddamn cockroach. Yeah, man. <laughs> that, that's like one of my, uh, I have a really good friend here locally, uh, Dustin six killer. He, you know, he's a great guy, great guy. He's, uh, you know, been doing, uh, you know, uh, dabbling in various businesses but one of his number one things is uh um uh iron life freedom and you know he helps a lot of you know he does a lot of work with veterans and, and disadvantaged uh families and children and uh people that are stuck in the prison system and whatnot but he he's been printing a shirt for for a long long time that says strong people are hard to kill and there's a lot of meaning to that. It's not just physical strength, strength, right? Yeah. It's fucking mental fucking fortitude. Absolutely. I like that. That's awesome. Yeah. Strong people are hard to kill. That's, that's, that's exactly it, man. That's the motto to live by right there. Exactly. <laughs> and I, and I, you know, I wear those shirts around and there's not a single shirt that I wear t-shirt that I get more compliments on. <laughs> that's badass yeah people just complete strangers will tell me all the time how awesome my shirt is <laughs> <laughs> that's, so, that's cool man so yeah if anybody's hearing that go look up iron life freedom look up dustin six killer support that guy he does good work yeah definitely and did you have any other note to close on we'll we'll talk about some stuff once we finish recording everything but i feel like that's a pretty solid note to end on everything. i think it's good all right, yeah. man. Thanks for coming on, by the way. This Absolutely, is so great. Man. Support us on Patreon or Anchor and find us on Instagram or Facebook. <laughs>